Can I get a little more attention, please? something out of the ordinary. I'm going to start on time. <laughs> and, I mean, and after that we're going to throw the watch away, I believe. Welcome to the Museum of the Gulf Coast. I'm Tom Neal, the director of the museum, and I'd like to acknowledge our board that we have there. The uh, board is from the Port Arthur Historical Society. They're the ones that operate the Museum of the Gulf Coast. Board members, if you'll just wave to me, so they will we'll see you guys out there. Uh, we've got a few more that are working in the gift shop. Uh, we appreciate our board and the support they give us. And uh, Bill Wersen's back there. Uh, Y'all know him from Port Nature's Indian Land. And, and uh, uh, Bill, happy birthday. It's his 80th birthday. Wow. <laughs> I'm a, you're going to catch me reading a lot today because I want to make sure everything gets to where it's supposed to be in the time we have. So we're not going to ramble around very much. Uh, I also like to acknowledge our president of the Port of the Historical Society, Dr. Sam Monroe. Uh, and, uh, many of you may not know, but Sam had the vision for this place. Uh, we knew all these music people. He had a, a love for Indian artifacts, and we started pulling all this thing together. But it, and he has been at the, the leadership of this thing since uh, its inception, and. Uh, it's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> came, out, came out pretty well. Okay, welcome to the Museum of the Gulf Coast. Uh, it's a 39,000 square foot facility. We're going to give you a commercial real quick. Uh, it's operated by Port Arthur Historical Society. We've been operating here since 1994. Uh, in recent years, we've enjoyed ongoing record-breaking numbers, and uh, visitors come here from all over the world. We have between 8 and 20 foreign countries come through our doors every month, 33 to 40 states surprises people, and it surprises a lot of them. They expect to walk into a 3,000 or 4,000 square foot museum, and they realize, they said, we need to bring a lunch to this place and come back tomorrow. We've actually had some stay and come back. Uh, I need to do a commercial for our, uh, we're a nonprofit organization, and we, like all the other nonprofits, are challenged with financial needs. Um, did I mention financial needs? Okay. <laughs> Memberships, uh, donations, memorial gifts, uh, gift shop, uh, and some of the memberships and donations are supported by you. And uh, our membership form looks like this. And it's uh, pretty cool because we, every time <coughs> one of our people in the Halls of Fame have a birthday, we post them on our uh, special email that we send all of our folks. And uh, so a lot of our people have been members, they join because they just think that's so cool that they're able to keep up. And it's hard to take in everybody in one setting, so it gives you a chance to break that down. Okay. The, uh, we, while we have all you people come from all over the world, we have still have that local appeal. Port Arthur News and Beaumont Enterprise readers still vote us number one year after year. We have some great uh, places in the region, and so we're just honored to, to keep having that thing from those readers. So that's, that's a good thing. We appreciate that. Um, as we, uh, as we in, in, in present our inductees today, uh, yes, I'll cover all the qualifications, or most everyone. Uh, so I think many of you know more than I do about this, but also we dug a little deeper so that we could find out a little bit more about individuals, things you can't Google, that uh, you'll learn about some of our inductees today. Uh, we're going to move this thing so we keep everything going. By the way, you'll see video clips today. Uh, some of them have as many as 40 or 50 edits to them. I mean, we're not watching a baseball game. We take all that time. and We're, we're cramming everything together real fast. So if you'll watch, you'll see, some, you'll see the point, and you'll see the person who we're featuring at that point. Let's see, we're going to be adding these four people to the other uh, over 200 people on the second floor. And I've got about 16 more left to do before the end of the year. And we have more beyond that that we haven't uh, gotten an official okay from the board. Um, we, um, uh, we use this working with children. Uh, that's our focus. Uh, we bring the kids in here. They sit down in front of our, our kiosk up there and we introduce them to a guy. Uh, that uh, Kelly Asbury, they don't know anybody, they think the adults are nuts for hanging all this stuff on the wall. But uh, we show Kelly Asbury, and once they meet Kelly uh, from Beaumont, Texas, he's the animator and director of all of their movies Toy Story, Romeo and Juliet, Smurfs, uh, the whole thing. And so, even internationally, they can't speak English. I've hit that, and they just, everybody lights up. And once they get that, they understand he has a backstory. And then they look around the room and they see the room in a different way. One thing we do, though, we let them know that all these people slept where they sleep, 
ate where they eat so they don't get a pass. We expect something out of them. The worst case scenario is they might organize their life a little bit better. They'll learn from any mistakes anybody made or any good things that they did. But the big thing is that they'll understand that, you know, you're not at a dead end here. You're at a launch pad. And uh, I, all I have to do is point to the second floor and over 200 people. I don't know of another place that has that kind of coverage. Okay, our inductees, Mike Simpson, is going to be first, Jason Tyner, uh, Jeff Granger, and uh, then we are in the Sports Hall of Fame, and then uh, Walter Humphrey will be in our notable uh, 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 Hall of Fame, and uh, he will, uh, and so that will, that will make up our group. We're going to move through these fast, so just be patient with me, and we'll get this done. All right, very first, I have Mike Simpson. <laughs> the technology a little bit today. Uh, our area has produced an overwhelming number of athletes considered, considering many years this area has celebrated the sport of football. The rivals are, rivalries are real and, and not imagined. Uh, one of these great uh, forces is the Port Nature's Groves Indians. Uh, they have produced quite a few top athletes, uh, but, you, but uh, you hear about it clearly from the most loyal and knowledgeable people that Mike Simpson might be the, at the top of the list. Uh, in fact, when you tell you, say, he is at the top of the list. That's a conversation I always have. One of the fastest folks to come out of Port Natchez. And uh, during his time at Port Natchez Groves, uh, Simpson uh, was legendary. Um, he, uh, he was uh, coached by our legendary uh, Bob Phillips, who's also in the Hall of Fame, and Wade Phillips was also in our Hall of Fame. He was a quarterback at that time. Uh, throughout Bob's career, he was known for great, uh, being a great motivator and one of the best defensive coaches, a distinction he shared with his son, Wade Phillips. Mike attributes much of Bum's influence on his success in high school. Correct, Mike? There you go. He's nodding his head. I got that right. All right. Uh, PNG Mike was a lead runner in a four-man, uh, 440 sprint relay team, uh, setting a national record of 41.2 seconds. A national record, okay? Wow. In 1965, uh, the, the uh, national record it, it, uh, remained unbroken for years. He also won the 220-meter uh, race in, uh, in the state meet. Uh, his records stand out to this day. Uh, when it, he went uh, with the uh, San Diego Chargers, Chargers, Mike held the uh, training camp team record for the fastest player to run the 40-yard dash in full pads at 4.5 seconds. <laughs> fastest time in history to win the Chargers. Another little high school side note that Mike was uh, elected king of the senior court with Queen uh, Laurie Nunez. Now, Wade Phillips and Laurie later were married. And Wade likes to remit mine, Mike. You may be the king, but I got the queen. <laughs> Isn't that about right, Mike? Yeah, yeah. Well, after uh, two years at uh, PNG, uh, Bob Phillips moved to the University of Houston. He recruited three of his uh, high school athletes. Uh, Mike Simpson, uh, Wade Phillips, and George Carraway. And George Carraway, you see a photograph of the three men with mom. That's, that's the three guys he recruited at the University of Houston. And George is also related to Robert Fong, who's our curator here. And uh, he's also videoing this. And I'll tell you now because I almost forgot. We're videoing this entire thing, so you don't have to feel like you have to get a video of this thing. We're putting it on YouTube, and you'll be able to grab it there. Okay, while in Houston, Simpson uh, uh, met his soon-to-be uh, wife, Becky Tips, who uh, was a sophomore during the senior year at uh, PNG. After graduating from the University of Houston, um, Mike was drafted to the San Diego Chargers in the 13th round of the NFL draft. Shortly after, the San Francisco uh, 49ers Vice President Jack White found Simpson and offered him a contract to play with the 49ers. Simpson's speed calls the San Francisco coaching staff to consider Mike uh, to a receiver position due to his speed. However, it was not long before they settled into the position of defensive back where his speed and ability allowed him to be a valued asset to the defense. 
Mike was um, with San Francisco from 1970 to 1974, along with Lamar University Football Hall of Famer Johnny Fuller, who will be inducting him in the, in the near future. During those four years, the 49ers won three NFC Western Division championships. After uh, seven grueling seasons, 1975 preseason ended his NFL career. Now get this, Mike is 5'9 and 170 pounds playing in NFL. Amazing. That's why you had to be quick, right? You had to keep getting run away from you people. Mike felt that his, his body had experienced enough punishment at the time. Becky and Mike had three children and eight grandchildren. After his uh, playing career, Mike and Becky settled in Henderson, Texas, where they live today. Mike grew up in the First Baptist Church in Groves, and his faith began very early. After his NFL days, Mike went into the ministry. Later, he and Becky uh, spent four years as missionaries in Honduras. Years later, after playing sport, Mike Simpson was just diagnosed with the beginning of dementia and Alzheimer's and, for, uh, and is participating in studies currently being conducted by the, on NFL players. Mike is still very active, walking weekly, and continues to play the guitar, a passion that began when his parents at age 10 bought him a Fender Esquire guitar. That started his love for playing the guitar in college days. Mike had a former team member who asked him to teach him how to play the guitar. As I understand it, that guy still has that beginner's book that Mike gave him. Oh, that, uh, oh, that person's name was Larry Gatlin. <laughs> we always had these little interesting twists. There, huh? Mike, uh, we're so glad that you're here to experience this with your family, and we're glad you could be back in Port Arthur. And uh, now we're going to welcome to the Sports Hall of Fame. We're going to see a little video, and so you'll, they'll know Mike Simpson a little bit better. star. Uh, they set the national record in the, in the 440 relay at the time. Mike was the anchor on that team uh, and held that record for, I think, 10 years. So uh, then I was lucky enough to go to University of Houston with Mike. We were uh, always been great friends, but uh, Mike could do other things. I mean, he could play the guitar. We would sing Hank Williams uh, songs in, in the dorm. He, he uh, taught Larry Gatlin how to play the guitar, really. Uh, so we had some fun times there. We had some great wins. Mike started as a sophomore, played all three years, um, started and played. And again, I, I don't know if he gave up very many, if any, touchdown passes. And then went on to play pro football and was a, was a really good player there, too. So uh, well deserved, Mike. We love you. a school song and fight song in case you're not for board <laughs> Thank you. 
attempt to lay that one here, number 38, in the program number one in your heart. Actually, you're number one in our hearts. Uh, congratulations on your induction uh, into the uh, Museum of the Gulf Coast. Well deserved. Uh, I never can tell you how much I appreciate the fact that you were the first one who showed me D chord on that old uh, beautiful Chet Atkins country gym. I hope you still have that. So uh, I'm sorry I can't be with you there. Uh, 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 sometimes that thing called life kind of, kind of gets in the way of stuff you'd really like to do too. But life is great. So congratulations again for number 38. God bless. I hope I'll see you sometime soon. It's been too long. That was Paul just coming in the door there. That bloop. I think he's going to paint the kitchen or something. Thank God. <laughs> God bless. Now, if I can find that button, we are rocking. Bye-bye. Hail Cougars. Hail. The Dick Gordon combo went flat in the face of a 49er defense that posted the first San Francisco shutout since 1961. The 49er defense in the person of little Mike Simpson, number 38, finished the afternoon scoring with an interception and a 32-yard run, which made the final score San Francisco 37, New Orleans 2. criteria the board of directors considers in placing someone in uh, the Hall of Fame. And I just want to mention quickly, you need to have roots in the Southeast Texas, uh, Southwest Louisiana area to qualify. Your work needs to have a national impact and there has to be a body of work created by the person. And then there needs to be general public recognition for the work that was accomplished. And you meet all of those uh, criteria as established by the board of directors. Several members of the board are here. I think Tom has acknowledged those persons. We appreciate their service on the board. Mike, it, you're in the Sports Hall of Fame in recognition of personal contributions to the popular culture of the Gulf Coast region, the United States, and the world. And it's my pleasure today to present you with this plaque. It's a memento of this occasion, one that we hope finds a place uh, in your home or office. I'm very appreciative to family and friends and to new acquaintances for being present today for my induction 
the Museum of the Gulf Coast Sports Hall of Fame. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the museum board for their vote of confidence and for my nephew, Steve Walker, for his initiative and hard work in compiling the required documentation for this occasion. Uh, my wife, Becky, reminded me of a sermon I preached to the congregation I pastored in Henderson, Texas, entitled Turtle on a Fence Post. Now try to visualize that picture in your mind. A turtle didn't get up on that fence post by himself. And I view that as an appropriate illustration of my life my love for football began by following my older brother Leo when PNG won the 1955 state championship. And uh, athletics has afforded me the opportunity to meet people like Bum Phillips and Ken Watson, Mo Bryan, Bill Yeoman, Melvin Robinson, Dick Nolan, whose influence shaped my athletic career. And I believe God has a design and a purpose for everyone and to use these men to develop my God-given gifts, which brought me to the museum. And let me say I'm grateful for your presence today and for our friendships, and thank you on behalf of the Simpson family. Mm Today, that uh, when I was a senior in high school, uh, he came to a, a church men's breakfast we had. His mother in law arranged it for us, and I was the first time I'd ever met anybody from the NFL. He was our speaker that day. Uh, there's also, I didn't mention something, there was a game that Dr. Phil always mentions on TV all the time. And Steve, you're talking about this, and Dr. Phil talks about how uh, uh, he played on that Oklahoma team that. Uh, when Houston beat him 100 to 6. <laughs> I bet you, 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 did, you, you, you had five touchdowns, didn't you? No, I don't remember. <laughs> well, that's what I heard. I was going to say, he probably felt like you're back at the track meet instead of the football meet, you know, going down the field. Congratulations. Next, we have Jason Tyner. Jason was born in 19, excuse me, 1977 in Bedford, Texas, and his family moved to Beaumont, Texas in 1979 when he was about two years old. And according to Richard Tyner, uh, Jason's dad, uh, sports was always a part of Jason's life. His dad was his t-ball coach and observed his ability to pick up the game. Baseball, he, he, he got it before age five, okay? I'm, I'm going to make my point here. Why would I say that? Because... By age five, Jason not only knew what an unassisted triple play was, he executed it once when he was five years old and once when he was six years old. There are grown men that don't know what an unassisted tri triple play is. It's so rare. Uh, it's, it, imagine since the beginning of recorded history of Major League Baseball, it's happened 15 times. And a five-year-old did in six. He showed them. Anyway, I, I, basically, I'll tell you real quick. A, a runner on first, a runner on second, you're the shortstop. A line drive comes to you and you catch it, first out. Well, this guy on second base, they, they're, they're ready to go. They took off. And they weren't expecting you to catch a fly ball and cut it, shut it up. He's already at the third base, so all you have to do is walk over and touch second base, second out, got him out. And then by that time, the First base runner is lit up and he's standing almost right by second base and you just touch the ball to him. <laughs> he did that at five. You can uh, you can go away saying you learned something today. Yeah. And he rips it to short. This could be a triple play at Wilbur. Unassisted. <laughs> 22 old speed. Right in front of him, Edgar Rectoria. He didn't even realize this. He goes on to throw it first. He didn't even do that. 
is an unassisted triple play. This has happened now 13 times in Major League history. The 80th second. The runners are going. The hit run is on. And it's going to be a triple play. At number two and at number three, an unassisted triple play for Rafael Forcal. One of the few times in the history of baseball that we have seen an unassisted triple play. Rafael Forcal gets all three of them. And so the worst <laughs> thing that could have happened for the Cardinals did happen. You know, it's going to be, it, it wouldn't work. So he doesn't move. So he starts to lean. And that's an excellent job there by for call not to take off for second base. A lot of times, guys still steal and they take off for the bag without waiting till the ball passes the hitter. But a great job there by for call, and that's after he didn't cover the bag on the play before. Well, it would have been interesting if he had swung and missed because Vinny Castilla did not go over to cover third. Well, it was going to be a stolen base. And then you're going to have runners in second and third, and that was going to be it. That's pretty interesting. Okay, a five-year-old did this, okay? This is, all right, it's funny because uh, when I talked to his dad, he said that, uh, that, uh, that the Jason came on over and sat in a dugout because he knew what he had done. And there was a coach in, and the team was still standing on the field. They didn't know what had happened. They, they totally, you know. Um, you know, if you uh, wonder if Jason has a, uh, natural baseball ability well uh case closed it's proven great time a great instinct jason had uh, a batting cage in the backyard uh that's sort of that's sort of like a guy on your block uh, where you live having a golf putting and chipping green in his backyard you don't play him okay not when i got that much connection to him when jason would come home from school and uh, on game day the first thing we do is hit a, bunch, a couple of buckets of ball by himself. And then the team would come over just before the game and do the same, and Jason would get in with them and do it, do it again. Jason was generally small growing up until finally he had a rapid growth spurt late in, uh, after his 12th birthday. It happened so fast that his growth plates separated uh, in his body. His parents took him to the doctor where it was diagnosed as a rapid growth uh, growth plates are, you know, the cartilage area at the end of the bones that expand when they're growing, but it doesn't calcify fast enough, so it, it creates issues. And so basically, it, he was able to just quit playing for a couple of months, and he was able to get right back into it. And I think I think you're going to see that he's, he he has a, has that talent, that ability. Um, the uh, his baseball career, he started little league in West End in Beaumont. He played high school sports, and he was all district. Uh, a selection in 1995-22-5A district and was nominated MVP. He graduated Westbrook High School in 95. He moved to Texas a and University where he was a three-time All-American. Uh, soon held a, a leader position uh, at uh, in the single season. Stolen bases, 41 with 107 hits. I asked uh, Jason that when he was trying to think of something to give us, I said, why don't you give us one of those stolen bases, one of those things you took. He didn't give us a home plate. His all-time uh, career uh, stolen bases was 119 and uh, hits 307, uh, and just amazing. Uh, in uh, 98, he was named the Big 12 Most Valuable Player. Jason was a member of the USA Collegiate Team. Upon graduation from college, he was the first round pick, draft pick for the New York Mets in 1998. Jason was drafted uh, in June, and unfortunately, his mother passed away. Uh, he, 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 he was uh, uh, drafted June 2nd, and she passed away on the 16th. Uh, he, he did not know what to do, but after about a month, he decided uh, they set up a foundation to, in blue of flower to give a tour of the uh, Julia Tyner Memorial Scholarship Foundation, established in her memory. And uh, after that, Jason began holding uh, local baseball camps between seasons, and the foundation was uh, active over a 20-year history where they were able to give over $100,000 in scholarships and awarded in increments of $1,500. And uh, 
He, uh, it helped his family a whole lot, especially with some of the lingering hospital bills from his mom's time, uh, battle with cancer. And Jason entered the Major League. He made his first uh, Major League debut in 2000 with hits off of uh, Hall of Famer Mike Messina. Uh, he established himself uh, uh, as a good base runner, uh, collecting uh, uh, this, the club's record and personal <coughs> career best of 31 stolen bases. That's a nice first year. Jason played for the New York Mets until 2000, and then he uh, was traded to Tampa Bay Rays. He played Tampa for Tampa Bay for, from 2001 to 2004, and then from 2005 to 7, uh, Jason played with the Minnesota Twins. After his professional career in 2007, Jason uh, was inducted into the Texas A&M Hall of Fame, and uh, as post-career, uh, he continues with baseball. Uh, he, he, he and a partner, uh, Martin Walker, who was with the Pittsburgh Pirates, uh, put together a baseball academy called Southeast Texas Baseball Academy in 2002. And every year they have these uh, events, and it uh, influences eight and 12 year olds to be able to participate uh, in this academy. And uh, also, uh, he runs youth tournaments in Fort Park, which uh, generates millions uh, to for visitors, uh, mi millions of dollars for visitors that come and participate in these things. It's a tremendous economic impact on Southeast Texas. Uh, let's see, uh, Jason also offers private training lessons. Jason married high school sweetheart Ann Tyner. In 2000, they had children Peyton, Presley, Reed, and Parker. As you keep up with uh, local sports, you can keep an eye on Jason, as currently he is the head baseball coach at Kelly High School. Uh, it's now time for, uh, I want to show you a little bit about, uh, show you what I'm going to mean about Jason. on the bench as Clemens gets set to go to work against Jason Tyner. And if you think you can see those eyes bulging wide, even from our center field camera, well, it's an exaggeration to be sure, but there's a little bit of something, a little bit to it, because Jason is taking that fresh-faced kid's approach to this series at Yankee Stadium. He walked in here this afternoon, not necessarily in awe of the surroundings, but I'll tell you what, he took a long look around this well, place. Well, I'll tell you one thing, Howie, this is a stadium that he got. Every major league, the first time he walks in, he's intimidated by this place. There's some big ghosts in this ballpark. The 2-0 from Clemens, a fastball over at the knees, 2-1. How about Jason Tyner? He was in AAA ball. Early in the week, he gets to call the big leagues. He's playing in the Subway Series. He's looked good, swinging the bat, putting the bat on the ball. On the outside corner, and Clemens has fought back to 2-2. Two two. Tyner says he understands the passion of fans and traditional rivalries. He knows it from the standpoint of being a Texas A&M when he played Texas. He said things could get pretty wild there. I think he's about to find out they can get a little bit wilder. Fans fall up and away, so Tyner runs a full count. Jason Tyner's dad was in New York for his major league debut on Monday. And has since gone back to Beaumont, Texas. Came back home after a couple of days away, 55 messages. Well, he answered the Fouled away. Remember you know when they ran off? Well, he was moving the infielders around. He had Derek Bell on deck. The big at that is right there's really moving those infielders around the time. Just move Brocious a little bit closer to the line at third base. Tough to set up the defense for Tyner except play him shallow because he can put the bat on the ball and he can use the whole field. And the payoff pitch from Clemens, it's hit in the air, center field, Jason Williams back, still going over his head. Tyner on his way to second, Williams up for the ball. And the Yankees just learned something about Jason Tyner right there. He does have some pop, not home run, not good. He just put it over the Speed 
to beat the throw. The throw was high, and Tyler gets in. This should be an easy out at third base. But speed always wins out. Jason Tyler, that's a, a huge base for the Mets and Tyler. You see that slide, and now you get runners at first and third for Mike Piazza. And now he's back. He rips one over shortstop for him. Head into left field. Goes in Larrys. You see if they can steal a base here. Here's Larrys muscling the ball in left field. Now Larrys wanted to get that ball in. Didn't get it in. Tight it up. Jason Tyner getting the ball back. Not on. And Tyner is two for two. Well, when you come out of that shooting, you know somebody can run. You got to rush him. And trying to get down that baseline in a hurry. Posada rushing the throw. You have that high release point. Nicky Martinez jump. Where did Posada an error on this? That's such a close was I mean, it would get him if it was a good throw. In fact, if Posada took a little bit more time, he has a very strong throwing arm. And just muscled up and threw that ball. He throws a strike. He gets Tyner at first base. I just thought that was going to be too close to assume that. But Tyner deserved the base hit. But it's an error. Most importantly for the Mets, he's a leadoff base runner. Yeah, Derek Bell taking a long look at Clemens. Take a look at his fastball. Very high release point by Clemens. And the ball gets by Posada. But when you're running to steal a base, well, he did see it. Surprised he didn't take off to third, although he... Still pretty good run back to the backstop for Posada. Jason just playing it conservatively with nobody out here in the third inning. Yeah, but and the heart of the order coming up. But a guy like that with a good speed and he's aggressive and stealing that base, he goes all the way to third base. You just put more pressure on Clemens. Do you take the split finger pitch away from him with the runner on third? But Tyner's at second, which is where he was after his lead off double in the first inning. Derek Bell is at first, and now it's Alfonso. The reach out of field is choice. Oh, and another one off the glove of Posada, and now they both move on. And a second and third, nobody out for the Mets. And when this happens to a pitcher like Clemens, who relies a lot on his catcher, we talk, that's when you try to pitch Piazza. The only thing he is, he can get that pitch. And if he gets that, he gets it a long way. And a one off. Fly ball well hit, center field, he's deep. Williams to the wall. There's a few Mets fans here too. Four nothing Mets. The Mets is sixteenth of the year. statement I always like to present in recognition of personal contributions to the popular culture and heritage of the Gulf Coast region, the United States, and the world. We hope this memento of this occasion will be something that will find its way into your home. Congratulations.
to speak, but uh, and, and Mike's speech was very good, so that's not good for me. Uh, but uh, first, I just want to say thank you to the museum, and uh, this is a great honor. Uh, I want to say thank you to my wife, Annie, and my family, my dad, and all my kids that are here. Happy birthday, Peyton. My 18-year-old, it's her birthday. She just got accepted in A&M a few days ago. Uh, you know, um, yeah, my, my, my dad preached, and my mom as well, preached hard work. Actually, my mom was probably harder on me than my dad. <laughs> she didn't let anything go. And, uh, you know, just instilled hard work. And, uh, you know, baseball's been very, very good to me uh, to a point where I've I've never had to get a real job in my life, so that's that's an accomplishment. <laughs> and uh, you know that video was that was awesome. I've never seen that video. Um, just the you had to dig deep. That that was my uh, that was my fourth major league game, uh, and that was either the first or second year that the Mets and Yankees started playing Subway. So there was fifty five thousand people at the game, and I was. Uh, leading off first Roger Clemens and when they introduced me I've never been booed I've never been cheered as loud as I was booed that day <laughs> and uh, that's a cool video because I honestly don't even remember s swinging you know it was because it was 32 count I think everybody stood up and uh, I don't remember swinging and I slid into second base and Derek Jeter's right there and I'm like holy cow like, this is <laughs> This is, uh, this is crazy. What have I got myself into? And, uh, you know, it just, it, it, it's, been a, it's been fun. I see a lot of, it, you know, now I, I coach kids and there's, I could see a bunch of my uh, Piranhas kids that I coach and a bunch of my high school kids that I coach in the back. And, 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 and that's been, uh, it's been a blessing. You know, I don't miss not playing because it was a hard life. I mean, it's a hard life. I mean, Jeff knows, Mike knows, it's a hard life. You got to have a good team, you know, because you know, there was many days where Annie's raising kids on her own, and I'm gone, and 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 she's been my best friend throughout this whole thing, and and she's been the best teammate I could ever ask for. Um, but uh, you know, I don't miss being away from home because I have all these kids in the back to coach and and yell at. Um, <laughs> I'm not near as uh, mean as my dad was. <laughs> so, you know, my dad coached high school football and he coached me at five and six years old the same way he coached high school football kids, which, you know, the crazy thing about that is now my 12 year old gets a free pass. Like, Pawpaw, my 12 year old walks all over Pawpaw. <laughs> like, so, but uh, I'm just a uh, big read. Uh, I'm just thankful to my family and friends for today, and I'm thankful to the museum for the for such an honor. Um, and uh, that's all I got. Thank you very much. Jeffrey, I'm sure that's how it went with me. You always pay close attention. Jeff was born in uh, San Pedro, California, but he grew up in Armsfield, Texas. Uh, Jeff uh, considers uh, his early years uh, growing up the most important. His family did not have a lot of extras, so his uh, brother Bobby, and he would come up with all kinds of different games to compete with each other. He played baseball with his older brother's friends who were three years older, and Jeff learned to get tough and raise his level of performance in competition so that it kept him uh, until he could keep up with the older boys. Uh, Jeff went to Orangefield School from 1986 to 1990. He was a National Honor Society honor graduate. He lettered 15 times in various sports, three in football, four baseball, three track, two basketball, and three in cross country. And in football in both 1988 and 89, he was an all-district and all-state. In 1990, he participated in the Whataburger All-State Game. 
baseball in 1989-90. Uh, he was all district first team, 89-99. He was also all state first team and voted MVP uh, on both of those years. Uh, also an outstanding uh, hitter, he holds uh, the Texas state record for the longest hitting streak, 42 games. And uh, in track, uh, he, uh, he was a district champ in 89-90. Uh, and from 90 to 94, Jeff went to college, uh, went to college at Texas A&M on scholarship. He was a collegiate two-sport athlete, excelling at both. He was quarterback of the football team, first string, and he was a lead pitcher for the baseball team. I mean, it's almost unheard of. <laughs> I'm glad you're a smart guy because you never got to go to class or study very much, did you? <laughs> he could, he could, uh, he could make. He decided that uh, his, his coach in baseball opened his eyes to what a career in baseball could be. So he started his focus uh, on the base, down the baseball line there to be a big league pitcher. He gave up his last two years of football eligibility to sign uh, some professional baseball uh, contract with the Kansas City Royals. Uh, he, he varsity lettered two times in football, three times in baseball. In football, he registered his second year in 91. He was a conference champ with a 10-2 season. And in 92, uh, they were the ch conference champs again with a 12-1 and season. That's when Jeff was the starting quarterback. Jeff has decided at the end of the uh, 91 ball season he was going to put the emphasis on baseball career. Um, Jeff is a loyal Aggie and uh, one of our other Hall of Famers that we have upstairs uh, pulled you to the side and called Aggie on you and said, you, got, you, know, you, bleed, you bleed that maroon color. R.C. Slocum was coach at that time. And he said, I got a great team, but I don't have anybody that's quarterback has experience. So he said, you got to do this. And so Jeff didn't want to do it, but he did because he was loyal. And so he was featured that quarterback in that great uh, that year. However, uh, Jeff, uh, re J he, uh, later in the season, he suffered a concussion and he dislocated his right shoulder and fortunately Jeff uh, throws with his left arm. Uh, in college baseball, 91-92, Jeff was first team All-American of uh, two seasons in 91-92, the Texas A&M uh, uh, Granger had a record of 16-6 with 251 strikeouts and 220 innings. During his first two seasons, 93, he broke the Aggie record with 150 strikeouts and broke Roger Clemens' Southwest Conference champion uh, career strikeout record. He was a College Station Regional MVP in uh, College uh, World Series, and uh, he's also All-American, first team. Uh, he also was finalist for the Golden Spike Award and also pitched for Team USA in, in international play. In college, Jeff was selected to play in the 91 Pan American Games and qualify with the Olympics for 92. Uh, unfortunately, he, he, uh, by the way, he got a bronze medal uh, in that particular thing, and uh, it was presented to him, put on his neck by uh, Cuban dictator Fidel Castro. That's a moment you won't forget. <laughs> Following college, uh, he was a first uh, round fifth pick for the Kansas City Royals. Uh, Jeff also played for Pittsburgh Pirates. Jeff played four seasons in the major leagues. In 98, Jeff was introduced uh, to, uh, well, I'm sorry, introduced, was inducted to the uh, Texas A&M Hall of Fame. And today, Jeff lives in Arlington. He, he uh, has um, called that home ever since 95. Jeff got married in 94 to his wife, Karen. They have uh, been married for 28 years. They have two grown children. And currently, Jeff works for J.P. Morgan, uh, as a private client advisor for the past 15 years. Jeff Granger. I'm telling you, you gotta love that Texas hospitality. First down and 10 for the Aggies. The ball is on the 22 yard line and that man right there is Granger, Jeff Granger, the man we talked about earlier. 6'4", 193 pounds, a sophomore. Gonna have to keep a close eye on his mechanics. Thank you. 
time, you even count it two and two. There's that major league fastball we were talking about at the beginning of the show, and this kid can really throw. And if you're looking for anything else besides number one, he'll throw it right by you. That one was 90 miles per hour on the right guy. Level, he'd be around 93, 94 on a normal day. Austin. Yeah, they're going to try to do anything they can against Granger. Hit and run, bunt, steal. The only problem with stealing against Granger, he has a great move at first. Here's John Wycheck, the first baseman. Yeah, it looked like it was a hit and run play, and here's Monroe breaking. He reads Granger very well, gets a pretty good jump. He's taking a look back to make sure where the ball is hit, sees that it's lifted and not very high to third base, and that's a hustle back. Just gets in. Dave Bingham wasn't kidding, was he? He did have the hit and run on right away. Loop the left hand hitter at the plate and watch it. Good level. He does have a good move, does Jeff Granger. He, not participating in Knoxville at that particular regional is in itself quite a feat for Dave Bingham's club. It speaks volumes for the rest of the club. You know, they're not to be taken lightly. He likes to hang up there with that uh, move to first base. What he likes to do is hang with that right leg, and then he reads the runner. Here you get a look at it as he's checking out Monroe. He hangs and then reads the runner and then flips it over. Actually, they got picked off. They sure do. That's what happens occasionally when you try to manufacture something. You have two outs. He had him going all the way, and Ranger, with that tremendous look back maneuver, was able to make the play. His uh, sophomore steps in for Jensen, Tennessee. Takes a step as the season progresses. In fact, like, this is a team you look at the numbers and you say, wait a minute, it's like all outside corner of the Navy's. Now you get a, a, a shot of where the KU batters are standing in the batter's box and they're wearing out that back line. And anytime a guy throws 93 miles an hour, you want to get as far away from him as possible. That last pitch was clocked at 88, and now the 3-1 pitch. He went two for four and has a lot to do with why Kansas is here. Goes to lay it down, and it'll go foul. Ranger had a chance to get there, and he's got good speed, and that's proof of it. Make it to this year's College World Series. First ever event for Turning the designated hitter today, Jeff Ranger. Took a few warm-up tosses during that long inning that really produced nothing. More quickly than he has. Get the ball, throw it kind of thing. Look at the batting average of the opposition. 193, and there's a guy. Plus, he's already at the 94 pitch goal. Lays it down with two strikes. No one's covering, but Ranger beats him. And going all the way to third is Rudolph. Boy, what an athletic play by Ranger there. Laid it down, that surprised everyone with two strikes. The only play really was for Granger to do it himself, and did he ever. This is a great play. This is what you see in the College World Series. Here's a fastball, eye high, and Rude finally gets one down. The first baseman comes over, and he's in the way, and a, just a great athletic play by Jeff Granger. Your quarterback instincts come into play here, picks up the fumble, Runs around right in. <laughs> You're out. Touchdown. <laughs> Got him in front. Jeff? <laughs> if you'll help me. Uh... Congratulations on your induction into the Museum Hall of Fame, Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, we have enjoyed uh, your great career, and it is remarkable to be able to play two sports at the level you play. In recognition of personal contributions to the popular cultural heritage of the Gulf Coast region, 
the United States and the world, we're happy to induct you into the Hall of Fame in the Museum of the Gulf Coast. We hope this memento of the occasion will find its way into your home. Sitting up front here, I didn't know how many people were here, and I'm very impressed. Uh, there's people way in the back, so thank you for coming out. I'd like to start off by thanking the Museum of the Gulf Coast. Uh, Tom here is the one that uh, got in contact with me and let me know I was going to be inducted, and I really appreciate it. When I say that I'm honored, my wife and I drove, we started at 3.30 in the morning, so we got here, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, uh, I'd like to also say it's very special to be inducted in the Hall of Fame uh, with Mr. Simpson, uh, with Jason, and Ms. Humphreys and her husband. Uh, I am truly and deeply happy, and I'm getting emotional, but it's amazing that, you know, we don't really know what we're doing. And when I say that, we're doing it because we love it, and you don't realize how good you are or that you may have messed up, uh, you just want to keep playing. And there's always a day that somebody is not going to give you a uniform anymore. Some kids, it's 12, 13, in high school, 18, 19. Uh, some people get to go to college. Uh, but there's a day you don't get a uniform anymore. And all the blood, sweat, and tears that you hear that people put into stuff, this is what makes it. So thank you. Um, There's a lot of people here that are special to me. My wife, Karen, <laughs> excuse me. Um, without her, just like Jason said, playing professional baseball is a grind. I mean, it's 162 games a year. You leave February 15th-ish, pitchers do. Hitters get to get a little later, but anyway. Uh, and spring training is a track me. And it's not baseball practice, it's track practice. Uh, the hitters get to hit all day long, they get blisters. But what people all know is you're gone from your home, and some people get to go down and visit you. Um, then you go off to where are you going to go? And for example, one year I was in Omaha, Nebraska, just like the video says. I was there pretty quick. Um, but my wife was still in school, and she was home, and it was tough. So um, we really appreciate all the support that everybody gives us. And whether it's football, whether it's baseball, whether it's being a lawyer or anything you do, you do it because you love it, but you keep doing it because of people like yourself. And we really appreciate it. Uh, my mother's here today. Uh, thank you. She sacrificed so much because we, we didn't have a lot of money. I mean, don't get me wrong. A lot of people in the 70s struggled, but the key is, is she wouldn't eat lunch. She wouldn't go out and buy extra things. So she could buy me a baseball glove. And mom, thank you. I love you. And without you, I wouldn't be here. Without that. <laughs> There's a lot of people from Orangefield here tonight. Thank you for coming. And honestly, I'm shocked at how many people from Orangefield are here. And not because I don't believe in them. I didn't call anybody. So, <laughs> uh, I am truly thankful for everybody here. My aunt and uncle are here. Uh, my best friend from high school, which you said you were going to call him, and I know you called him. He must not have gave up the secrets that we had, so I owe you the $20. Uh, uh, but everybody here, thank you. And once again, I'm very, very happy to be a part of this. Thank you very much.
promise keep this moving along. <laughs> he did tell me you uh, studied a whole lot, worked out all that when people didn't know you were doing that. I said, when she came into your life, you kind of straightened up and flew right. So I, I, I get the influence. <laughs> Next, our last inductee today, special person to our area. Today, uh, we induct Walter Humphrey uh, into our Museum of the Hall, uh, Noble People Hall of Fame. Just a little note, Walter, uh, several years ago, uh, many years ago, <laughs> Uh, lend his name to uh, helping us raise funds so we could even have this place. And uh, we had a roast for uh, Walter, and you'll get the spirit of that here in just a minute. But uh, he was always, uh, always giving. Uh, as we focus on the, uh, his background, we'll also take a look at his amazing and most notable partner he, sh uh, he shared in one <laughs> Sheila McCarthy Humphrey, whose mom thought Walter was cute and good for her little girl. Here we go. <laughs> uh, Walter grew up in Port Arthur. He, um, he and his sister Carolyn were raised by his stepfather, Justice of the Peace Fulton Lee, and his mother, Grace Gardner Humphrey um, Lee. And then Judge, uh, Judge Lee was a wonderful and highly respected pillar of the community. Walter graduated Thomas Jefferson in 1954. In high school, was a member of the Projectors Club, uh, the club that a group of guys that donated valuable study hall time and went around and showed videos and movies, not, not, not videos, but movies, films in the classroom at that time. He also was the sports writer and editor of the pilot, the school newspaper. He, in his senior year, he was elected into the senior court as a gentleman in waiting. He also wrote uh, game stories for each of the football games featured in the Yellow Jacket, the class annual. In his senior year, Walter uh, loved football and he was all district guard and all state second team. His uh, good friend uh, Carl Larpenter also was uh, all district and all state first team, and we'll be inducting Carl Larpenter in here uh, shortly. He was good friends with uh, Junior Hanson and Skipper Thompson in high school. Uh, Walter was much like as uh, many of the youth growing up here today, playing and working and saving money and you know, taking care of job opportunities to go, get, to go forward. After graduating high school, Walter went to SMU on football scholarships, but later uh, transferred to Baylor University where he graduated in 1959 with a BBA. Walter asked, uh, uh, used to paint uh, houses uh, to make some extra money and Mr. Baker was a gentleman in town that he uh, would help, and he turned out to be a father of a good friend of Sheila McCarthy, Kay Baker. Uh, one time when he was uh, painting a paint job, he happened to notice that girl walking by, and he had to find out who she was, that was Sheila. So first, uh, she first met Walter when he was a junior in college, and they come home from Baylor. He crashed Sheila's senior after prom dance that was being held on Pleasure Island, he arrived there to ask Sheila to go out on a date. Uh, she told him no. <laughs> she did not uh, really know what uh, what to think of him. Uh, uh, she did think that he was a very. She thought it was very weird for him to a junior in college be pursuing a senior in high school. She told him that he should get a life and date people his own age. <laughs> Is this coming back to you, Sheila? <laughs> Later on, Walter called her again for a date, and Sheila said yes. And after thinking about it for a little while, it was her senior year, she wanted to be with some of her friends. He said, I don't know this guy, so she canceled the date and called it off. So uh, and several weeks later, he was, um, Walter was at the beach with uh, his friend Junior Hanson uh, visiting uh, Junior's aunt's beach house. Sheila's mother was there uh, visiting T.C. Uh, and so Sheila's mom, uh, met Walter and said, I think you ought to ask my daughter out on a date because I think you're cute. And he, I, you see where I'm going with that, okay? Walter uh, added, well, who is your daughter? She said, Sheila McCarthy. He said, I told her, you know, he had already asked her out twice and she broke the first, she broke the last date. Her mom told him, ask her out again and I'll make sure she gets, she goes <laughs> because I think you're cute. Okay, her mom uh, told Sheila about her conversation with Walter, and uh, Sheila 
The response to her mother was, thanks, Mom, for pimping me out. <laughs> oh, my parents. She called Sheila, uh, and uh, he called Sheila, and um, and said his mom, her mom had told him to call her back, and so they, they went out on that date and they ended up dating uh, the rest of that uh, summer long. Uh, and I confirmed this one, uh, this next story I have to tell you. All I had to tell you is I heard that Walter bought some blue jeans, and after that she just started laughing on the end of the phone, and I had to wait a while for her to quit. So I said, okay, it is true, so I'm going to lay it out there to you. Early in their marriage, uh, their relationship was like uh, so many that need a little some, some adjusting as you go along. A close friend told me one day uh, Walter had, been, had just purchased some new blue jeans and proceeded to pull tags off walking through the house to put them on. One tag fell on the floor, and as, he, as the story goes, Sheila told Walter, hey, you dropped a tag. He said, well, what do you want me to do? Sheila said, you pick it up. Walter, get ready for this one. Walter, Walter responds, well, that's woman's work. <laughs> hey, we're not through with this story. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is beautiful. Sheila left that tag on the floor. It stayed there on the floor until they moved to another home years later. In fact, they it even remained there after they changed the carpet, it went back down on the floor. And they would have friends come over and say, hey, you got a tag over here, and she and Walter walk, don't pick it up, don't pick it up. What a way to handle that, that is smooth. Um, anyway, uh, um, ladies and gentlemen, if you ever, if you didn't, if you didn't know before, uh, Walter had met his match in Sheila. I imagine that Walter, uh, Sheila, I imagine that uh, Walter probably was glad that you decided to practice law, but I don't think he would have wanted to meet you across the table in the courtroom. Judge Gerald Eddings, former uh, partner of Walter, um, he said he had a strong work ethic and worked 12 hour days. So many of his uh, accomplishments are, are remarkable. He was a trailblazer in his profession. He was known for his landmark work, uh, then uh, resulted in huge early judgments and settlements for asbestos, uh, which harmed workers. Walter also knew, uh, was known for uh, representing the state of Texas by taking on the huge tobacco industry. What did, what, uh, he did what no one thought it could be done. In 1995, the landmark case resulted in Big Tobacco settling for $17.3 billion, the largest legal settlement in American history. And later, that, te that template for what Walter had done was used in every state. And so after every state settled up with, the, with Big Tobacco, it reached a 25-year uh, payout, $246 billion, uh, with the co country's largest tobacco companies. Uh, according to uh, Sue Greenway, who's right over here, she was uh, Walter's administrative assistant for uh, 36 years, I believe. Uh, Walter's, uh, uh, I'm going to to many, he would reach out and help people all around the region, many uh, that he didn't even know. Uh, he may hear uh, difficulties and, and would do something just to help them, often some with uh, special needs or often uh, monetary needs. Uh, he would offer, he, we offer, kind of, we kind of call it a paying forward. When Walter just had that done long before that, and he, he, would, he had the ability, and so he would spot things, and he would want to make a difference. On his um, many traits, another he described was Walter's personal commitment to returning every phone call that he received that day, if not that day, very quick after that. Sadly, we lost Walter September 7, 2021. Walter was a boy from Port Arthur, Texas that accomplished so much, but most importantly, Walter built relationships and lifelong friends. He was able to uh, relate to everyone because of his common uh, humanity and was known to listen. He never forgot where he came from. He and Sheila never forgot their friends uh, or their hometown area. Walter was the trailblazer champion of the working man. Thomas Walter Humphrey was a... Was a uh, once in a generation transform, transformal figure. Uh, Sheila and Walter had two children, Bart and daughter Paige, and found, uh, uh, I found this tribute that Sheila paid Walter uh, in his passing away. It said, he was my best friend and the love of my life for 63 years, married for 61. I started dating two years before that. 
Uh, he was not only a legend in his profession, but a legend to her personally. She loved being considered, he loved being considered a champion for the working man. Senator Carl Parker. Oh, Walter, you know, he heard it's going to be hot tonight. He tried to buy him a, he tried to buy him an asbestos suit. Nobody would sell him one. <laughs> now, I read in this program, West, where Humphrey has a great, you know, he wins all his cases and it's probably attributable to his dedication to research. I'm going to say that's a bunch of bugs. I mean, he just got poured out on a whiskey case against Seagram by the Supreme Court. He's been researching that for 40 years. <laughs> I, knew that, I knew that when Walter quit being an insurance adjuster and bought himself a degree from Baylor, that he was going to be a tough competitor for most personal injury lawyers. I mean, hell, we were chasing ambulances, and he went and bought himself one. Got Junior Hanson to run it. <laughs> but I mean, in all the thanks Junior gets, now he's got to obey all the game laws. <laughs> Some of you don't live here won't understand that. <laughs> Now, I'm going to tell you though, he's not all that great a lawyer. You ever notice Walter, he never tries a case alone. He got one of these smart young guys with him. But let me tell you how that happened. Walter, soon as, about, about six months after he left the DA's office, he was trying a case, had to do with some, some of those big fancy Houston lawyers. BTHL, I call them, big time Houston lawyers over here on the other side. And two of them were there, and he was representing this widow woman. And things were going good. He thought he was just tearing these witnesses up on cross-examination. Came the first break, got out in the hall, and this little old lady said, Walter, said, I want you to get somebody to help me try this case. He said, well, I thought I was doing good. She said, well, I've been watching. He said, when you up talking, said, when there's one lawyer from Houston, he's up talking. He said, that other is sitting at the table thinking. He said, when you up talking, so ain't nobody thinking. <laughs> And I want to say this about well, whatever you say about him, he has never forgotten where he came from. And he's never forgotten his old friends. He's been generous to a fault for not only the friends and individuals that have helped him through life, but he's been very generous with his community and the places that he has gone and the places he has touched. He's a good sport for putting up with this in the name of charity, but Walter, I want to tell you, if you think it's rough tonight, just come up and answer the Senate phone for about two hours and you'll think this is a vacation. Ladies and gentlemen, a great deal of pleasure. Governor Ann Richards. pathetic or not. <laughs> now you know why the women are taking over. <laughs> Bum Phillips told me tonight when I was coming in that a wonderful thing happened at the International Peace Conference they had in Houston not too long ago that they made an agreement with the Japanese that forever Toyota Japanese sent to Houston, they could send a lawyer to Japan. <laughs> you just look at this head table. What you see is enough beef for a meat locker. <laughs> and you know you are in bad shape when you call a politician to add class to a head table. <laughs> I've made 400 appointments. And Walter's the only one who got bad press. But he 
we got enough to make up for the other 399. And of course, I was thrilled to have dinner with Don Rickles. I heard that Walter Humphrey paid Rickles $25,000 to be here tonight. But to tell you the truth, Rickles, from my own personal experience, you could have asked for more. <laughs> I am here because in the few short months that I've been governor, Walter Humphrey has caused me so much grief that I think that it is time that I return the favor. The truth of the matter is that as a camper, a hunter, and a fisherwoman, I view the appointments to the Parks and Wildlife Board with great seriousness. I had my staff call over and ask what Parks and Wildlife people look like. And the word came back that they look sort of like a cross between a bear and a washed up fight promoter. So immediately I thought of Walter. <laughs> Poor Walter, he can't help it, he just can't stop making money no matter how hard he tries. Walter Humphrey is the fourth richest lawyer in the United States. Two of the other three work for him. <laughs> and the third one just hired Joe Jamail to handle his smaller cases. Walter walks into a courtroom and the opposing side gets out a checkbook and asks how much. He goes to Las Vegas and they board up the storefronts and they clear off the streets. He is so rich that he makes loans to Latin American countries and he's so mean that they pay him back. Walter has spent his whole life on the road to success from an insurance adjuster to a trial lawyer. Just a short step from the curb to the gutter. <laughs> but Walter truly has redemptive qualities. And this is what you've been waiting for. Because beneath that pinstripe slick lies the heart and soul of a good old boy. And you know how real good old boys are never happier than they are when they're outdoors looking for something to kill. <laughs> We've all seen the picture of the deep blue of the Texas night sky the hint of starlight and the UT orange glow of the campfire and around it are the manly forms of the good old boys doing what real he men do drinking beer and staring at nothing in particular Walter's world, the place where he feels the most in tune with the great good old boy cosmos. And I'm glad I knew that about him because for the longest time I could not figure out why on earth Walter Humphrey would care so much about being on the board at Park and Wildlife. Well, the possibilities are endless. So of course Walter wanted it. Of course he had his heart set on it. What red-blooded American man could resist it? And I couldn't turn him down. I caught a lot of hell for him. But I'm here to tell you tonight that whatever you want to say about it, at the board's first meeting, he was the only member who did not throw up or go to sleep. And from where I stand, that's a real improvement. 
It may be one small step for man, but it's a giant leap forward for a good old boy. And that's what the new Texas is all about. Bless you. Sheila, thank you for putting up with all of this. Thing. For the second time, because you were there that evening. Uh, we have uh, an unveiling that uh, we're going to do, just like we've done the other, but we have one other that was part of that post that we decided we'd just use it again, then, because uh, uh, I think there is another statue of Walter and maybe another location or two, but we think ours is the best, so we'll, we'll, we'll unveil that one today. Would you come forward? Sheila, I'm going to present this uh, plaque to you to help remember this occasion. And I want to say that Miss Polly, your mother, is one of our early supporters for the New Zealand Bill. As you probably know, and Miss Grace, Walter's mother, worked in the gift shop here as a volunteer. And she understood how to work the cash register. That was always a big issue. <laughs> the volunteers had trouble with that cash register. But she knew how to do it. We want to, we are grateful to you and to Walter Humphrey for all the things that he has done. In fact, that fundraising event was a Port Arthur News homecoming event. Some of you may remember that. It was a major event, first major event to raise money for the museum. You were there that night, of course, and it was a, it was a great night. In recognition of personal contributions to the popular cultural heritage of the Gulf Coast region of the United States, we're happy to include Walter Upry in the Notable People Hall of Fame. supposed to do this. <laughs> so, uh, and I have a tough thing to follow Mike and Jason and Jeff. This is Walter's type of thing to do. He was the trial lawyer that got up and was able to talk to everybody and visit with everybody and win cases. So, I'm just going to kind of just say thank you to the museum. I really appreciate this. This is quite an honor and he would have been thrilled. He really would have been thrilled. We, all these people that showed up, this is, I'm so impressed with the crowds that are here. This is just really wonderful. And other than that, I just, this is it, y'all. <laughs> I'm not the talker. <laughs> so thank y'all very much for showing up. I wish we had a big theater we could put everybody in, but uh, I thank you so much for your patience. Uh, we'll ask you again, uh, join the museum. That's how we keep this thing going. And uh, we have uh, forms at the front desk where you come in there and they can uh, set you up, take care of you. But uh, we would appreciate your support. Actually, this fun you had today, we have it every day here, okay? And so thank you so much for being here. Congratulations to inductees. And we have another event coming up October 29th. And another one coming up November 12th and another one December 17th. So we're working our way through this and some great, amazing people like we had today. Thank you so much for being here.